There's nothing like League. And this is the Betfred Super League. Well, it was a mere 19 years ago that Salford were last at Wembley. They lost 11-6 to Castleford. David Watkins led them that day. This week, he was back at Salford. Oh, really, I mean, when I came in here for the first time ever, I mean, I walked in, Brian Snape had signed me, and he brought me up to Salford, and it was my rugby league uh, baptism. I walked down the steps, and all the team were waiting for me to come in to see where they paid all this money for this fella from South Wales. <laughs> And uh, Joe Southwood came in with a broken leg. Terry Ogden came in on crutches. David Evans, the fullback, had 27 stitches in his head. And I thought to myself, God, fathers. <laughs> and somebody was saying, it's not that hard, really, you know. <laughs> Took a bit of convincing. Hello again, everyone, and welcome along to this latest edition of Eddie and Steve-O, the podcast, with thanks, as always, to our supporters from Betfred. And I'm sorry to say something of a sombre start to this week's proceedings because over the weekend came news of the sad passing of the great and legendary Welshman David Watkins, a dual code rugby international who achieved true legendary status at the Salford Club in the 1960s and 70s. More than that, I am proud to say David, his wife Jane and the family became close personal friends of my family for over 40 years and so this news has hit me personally really hard. Steve-O, David Watkins, I have never heard a bad word said about him, and this is reflected in all the tributes that have been pouring in this week. A great man. And I don't just mean that as a player, both as Rugby Union and Rugby League, of course, but every time you met him, every time you spoke to him, he was always the perfect gentleman. There was no fuss, there was no animosity when you played against him. And of course, I had my debut against New Zealand at Castleford. That was my first ever Great Britain International. And I'm proud to say that playing in the centres that particular day was David Watkins. It didn't finish up the way we wanted it. Uh, the Kiwis beat us that day. And... I'll always remember sort of in the dressing room after, uh, we were all distraught. But fair play to the Kiwis. They played better on that particular day. And it was also uh, my first uh, sort of representative for Great Britain. And it turned out to be the last one for Alex Murphy. So two great players and, of course, David Watkins. It was a pleasure to know him and rest in peace. One of the greats one of the legends of our wonderful game. Absolutely. I mean, he received a, a club record fee back in the day of £16,000 when he left Newport to turn professional for Salford. This was in 1967. Uh, rugby Union then, of course, still an amateur sport. But what an impact he made in his adopted sport. Regarded still as Salford's finest post-war player, one of the greatest of all time. Listen to this, Steve-O. A club record 2,960 points 147 tries 1,241 goals 407 appearances over 12 years absolutely fantastic a fearless and courageous competitor wonderful stats Eddie absolutely outstanding and that just gives you the sort of inside running because so many of the top clubs I know Leeds St. Helens uh, Wigan they all wanted to sign this mercurial three-quarter that they called David Watkins from Rugby Union. And there was talk about people arriving with suitcases full of money, so <laughs> much cash. And let's try to evaluate it now in regards to what would it, what would it be at £16,000 in today's money? It's got to be at least a quarter of a million, at least... I would think so, and he would be worth every penny. Do you know, Eddie, he was one of those players that there was nothing dirty about him. You could try to rough him up, and let's face it, you know, the coaches that I've been under, and every time you played against a great player, you'll guarantee the coach will say, look, rough him up. This, this lad from Rugby Union, he, he won't be able to handle it. Oh, he could handle it okay. But you had to get hold of him first, 
<laughs> he, well, was, that's he was a difficult man to tackle because he had a great sidestep, a great dummy. He had the swerve. He, he had everything that both a rugby union and a rugby league player needed to become a legend. And he was. He was. Prodigious talent. And he had the film star looks as well, didn't he? I mean, Dave was often referred to, and I used to call him this he, when I spoke to him. You know, when you signed, David, I said you were the George Best of rugby league. He really was. And he, actually, when you look at the pictures of him now, he looked like Georgie Best. He really did. And he had all the talent, all the talent in the world. Well, of course, uh, you also worked together, Eddie, uh, through the media and through radio. Indeed. And uh, it come to a point where I'm thinking, there's Eddie saying he was very attractive, looked like Georgie Best, <laughs> and then you finished <laughs> you finished up with me. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. And that, but I mean, what, me what a contrast! I, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, how different might it have been? Because when I joined Sky in uh, 1989, 1990, I desperately, desperately tried to persuade David to come with me, but he was working then uh, on Scrum Down on Yorkshire Television with the great John Helm. And being the sort of man he was, such a loyal guy, he said, no, look, I'm with John. Uh, I'm not going to switch. I'm not going to switch. I'm going to leave you to it. You carry on and you go. And when I think about it now, how di how different things might have been. And David come with me, the great Steve-O, the great Steve-O might never have been invented. We might never have hit the airwaves in the UK. <laughs> I mean, how different how different things could have been. Well, you finished up with a bald one. <laughs> yeah. but, but all I can say, you started out with one of the best, Eddie. It is a, a, a part of Salford, the Salford Rugby League Club. And I think that it would be a great boost for rugby league in general and a great boost for Salford people in general if their club was to get a Wembley to a final. And uh, nobody will be shouting more than I will. David Watkins, one of the all-time Salford greats. I wonder what David would be thinking right now about Salford. OK, they lost at Wigan on Friday, but they're still in with the shout of a playoff place, aren't they? Two points behind Hull KR, two points ahead of Leeds. This is the closest race for the top six in years. Wigan top, Catalan, <laughs> they've lost the last two even though we had Steve McNamara on the podcast last week. Uh, Saints are in the hunt as well. All three have got 34 points. Three games left to play. Top two means the home semi-final and a game, a game uh, away from Old Trafford. The stakes, Steve-O, could not be higher as we end, enter the end of the season. Well, the biggest problem that the coaches of all those teams that you've mentioned, Eddie, is that should I rest certain players... Now, it's happened in Australia where Brisbane, uh, they rested a few of their players, um, which allowed when Penrith won on the weekend, they picked up the league leader's minor premiership trophy. So, therefore, they've picked up a trophy already and they're red-hot favourites. But will the coaches in the UK rest a few of the star players because they realise that they're in a, a good position they're not going to miss out on the playoffs and it could see the turning of the tide you think so, who do you think is going to finish top then who do you think is going to enter in from one and two into the playoffs the semi-finals at home who do you think is going to get that wonderful wonderful bonus I think it'll be the Wigan or St. Helens Wow. Okay. At one at one point, I thought that uh, Wigan perhaps lacked the experience, the old stages to perhaps get back into the swing of things. We realised that St. Helens started the season off up and down after winning the the the, the world championship down under. Uh, it was a bit of a rocky road, but they they've steadied themselves. And the experience that those two teams have got. But Wigan have bounced back. I'm a bit disappointed uh, with Catalan. It appears to me as though 
that something might be wrong there, Eddie. They were on the crest of a wave. They were, you know, four points in, in front in the league table at one particular point in the season. And I don't know. They just seem to they just seem to crumble at a time when they should win most of their games down under, uh, down in, in France, should I say, because of the weather situation. But has it got to them? Impossible to tell, really. I mean, when I spoke to Steve McNamara last week, he was... Um... He was bullish, but he wasn't uh, overconfident. And, of course, the, the travel that they have to um, undertake week in, week out is a problem for them. The temperatures, they no team, he reckons, trains less than the Catalan Dragons. Having said that, you know, uh, they were beaten comprehensively by Wigan. Uh, they lost at Hulkingston Rovers. Uh, something has gone slightly awry. Uh, but th they're still there. They're, there's three of them on 34 points. They're all in with a great chance. All three of them, Saints, Wigan and Catalan. I wouldn't write the Dragons off, Steve O, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Oh no, no, no. No, no, no certainly not. They've got a, they've got the opportunity. But um, you know, having so many points put on them with virtually no reply, now that gives an indication that there's not just one thing wrong, there's quite a few things wrong. And I I'm I'm at loss to try to find out what it is. I mean it, We've seen throughout this season that they they've been uh, bullish, they've had great defence, and all of a sudden it seems to have fallen apart. It's not how you start the season, Eddie. It's how you finish it. Isn't that a great song? It's not how you start. It's how you finish. It's absolutely spot on for the Super League in 2023. No doubt about that. Uh, Floodlight failure, Steve. At the Lee Sports Village, for goodness' sake! <laughs> <laughs> this is a brand new stadium. How on earth does this, ha this happen? And why? Why does it happen to us in rugby league? Good God! Well, uh, you know, Eddie. Um, sometimes in the north of England, uh, it was difficult to get a shilling into the meter <laughs> to keep the keep the electricity going. Uh, I know many a household that tried everything. Uh, but it wasn't a shilling. They tried anything to push it to make that to make it work. Uh, it, it's just amazing, isn't it? That you know, a brand new stadium. They got everything right here, there, and everybody. But it's not just in rugby league. It has happened in in other sports, not as often, but it has happened. It has. Do you remember when Lee came back? Oh, I think I can't remember the year, but a long long time ago and we were there at their first game at Hilton Park now bear in mind Hilton Park with all due respect was falling to pieces uh, there was a floodlight failure they somehow got it going I think they threw the bloke back on the bike and kept kept him pedalling away and they got the lights back on <laughs> but, but it has happened to Lee before but I can't believe it happened at the weekend at this Lee Sports Village it's a fantastic stadium yeah I know and, and let's be fair isn't it great that within a couple of days uh, they restarted the game <laughs> yes I know at, uh, I mean at one time you'd sort of think to yourself well oh we're doomed you know what are we going to do with this it's, uh... but they've sorted it out and the one thing that we've, we have sorted out at long last we've got a television deal haven't we just indeed it's been done and dusted Sky have got it for three more years now this is the big thing every game is going to be covered by the TV cameras full details of when and how will follow the negotiations are underway Channel 4's involvement yet to be announced but they have been offered more games will they pay this time question mark or will everything go on the Sky platform let's wait and see but all games will be televised and you know from our point of view being I suppose loyal Sky people. I'm delighted that Sky have got it for the next three years. I know all the fans aren't. There's letters in all the papers, you know, get shut of Sky. They don't realise that Sky pay money. They pay money to transmit these games. Uh, but I'm, I am personally delighted that Sky have got the got the deal and got it over the line. Yeah, and so am I. But uh, I've often wondered why it's taken so long. I know. Um, Maybe maybe Super League, and this is only my opinion, is Super League, it, they wanted to test the market, see whether Sky would go any higher than what they'd, what they'd offered. And when you look at it, um, why, is, uh, why is Super League giving away television coverage for nothing? And if we start next season 
and we're giving the game away, it's not right. No, I just think maybe uh, this is the point I was going to make. Maybe they see uh, terrestrial free-to-air television as a bit of a lost leader. You know, you will attract uh, viewers to subscribe to however we're going to watch it uh, next year, Sky or on a, a streaming service. You'll attract more viewers to have a bash at, at joining in. And that's where Sky uh, Channel 4 is so important. I, I, I don't know. I'm not involved in the negotiations, of course. Well, I I'll put it this way. Um, maybe one of the top teams, say St. Helens or Wigan or Leeds or whatever, uh, they come out with something a little bit similar. Uh, the first 200 that come to pay through the gate gets in free. <laughs> so that when they're in free, they say, oh, this is, this is a good game. Uh, I think I'll come and watch it and uh, I'll pay next time. You can't tell me that's that, that that's good business. The big thing, though, Steve, is that all games will be televised. Yes, which means I'm pleased that with that. Well, we're going to get video referees at each game. Now, is that a good thing or not? Our old pal Philip Clark doesn't seem to think so. He has been quoted this week as saying, video referee, a waste of time. What do you think? Well, it is a right to his own opinion, but I think he's got it wrong. How many times have we seen tries that we thought were not scored when they slow it down? It was scored. And look at the fantastic efforts that we get from tries scored into the corner. It's magnificent. It is. Athleticism. It's just, it's just outstanding. And I think we're right we should have the video referee. I'm not too happy with a captain's challenge no. that they have in Australia. No, I don't, nonsense. I don't like that because I've always said the one good thing about rugby league is that it's fast and it's furious. And things like this, the captain's challenge, is slowing the game down. And I tell you, you what also, Steve, I would, I would um, throw out the window, the, the business where the, the on-field referee hands it up as a try hands it up as a no try just let the video referee have his say as it was in the, the first X number of years of the video referee system, if there's a doubt let the video ref sort it out don't put any pressure on him, oh we can't see the balls down, we can't see this, we can't see that, well the on field decision is try, it's a try uh, you know, I, I would just let the video referee have a bash and leave it I'm with, it. You. I'm with you and look <laughs> Since we've over, we've had TV to show our game, it's helped. It's not only helped in spread spread the word; it's also helped um, with the players. And the one good thing that a lot of people forget is that because it's on television and because they have reviews, people who have been getting away with belting people with their elbows, etc., and so forth, doing illegal stuff out on the field of play which can injure the players that had gone in the past absolutely yeah there's nothing wrong with the video referee we started it in 1996 and hey presto the English Premier League have taken it on in the VAR you know the video assistant referee they call it the rugby yeah. union have it as the TMO can you remember the, a, a game down in Paris when it was Paris Saint-Germain uh, the first one. Yeah. Uh, went. Let's go to the screen. Yes, yeah, Stuart Cummins was a man. Stuart, put the first Stuart square Cummins. In the air. Yeah, yeah. Put the square in the air, and everybody went. What's all that about? <laughs> yeah, including us, by the way. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> we we weren't briefed properly. That's my opinion. We were not briefed properly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, dear me. Oh, right. Well, uh, listen, we, 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 all, we had our ideas and this new television deal uh, will have its new ideas. Let's wait and see what happens when all the details are finally and, and, thrashed out. And, watch, watch this space. But there's something else up for discussion, and that's a revamp of the Challenge Cup. We know the finals are going to be played next June. That's a switch from August. And for the first time since 1896, they are proposing, here we go, a group stage format involving 24 teams, followed by a knockout stage and then the final. Twelve Super League clubs 
will enter the group stages. They'll be joined by 12 other teams. Those 12 decided by a traditional knockout format in the early rounds involving the championship clubs, League One clubs and the community game. The group stages will involve eight groups of three, playing one at home, one away. Teams will be seeded to ensure an even split. The eight group winners will then enter the quarterfinals and progress eventually to the final for two of them. A round robin format was discovered, but deemed uh, was discussed rather, but deemed to be not that popular with the clubs or the fans. Stevo, here is a sixty-four thousand dollar question for you: Why on earth? Are they trying to mess about with the oldest cup competition in the world? I agree. Why? Why on earth? Why on the this planet? Why are they even considering it? As you say, you've already said it, the Challenge Cup. Keep it as it is. I agree with taking it back earlier in the season. Yeah, me I never too. Liked, I never liked it when it was said, look, sometimes it was interfering with the positions or the playoff, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, just leave it alone. You know, but if it's not broken, then why mend it? Absolutely. If it's not broke, don't fix it. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that's our say on that. Uh, Paul Wellen, Steve O, he's going to be involved in the Autumn Test Series against Tonga, but he's going to be assisting the Tongan coach, Christian Wolf, his former boss at St. Helens, of course, against England in this three test series what's the um, what's the the sentence for treason for high treason is that a bit <laughs> is that a bit strong uh, I think rather <laughs> I think I think we've got to understand one thing uh, Paul Wellens uh, is doing a good job into the new position as a coach and you've got to learn as much as possible and the best way to learn you and I went to school and the teachers um, we looked and we got guidance from them Paul Wellens will get guidance with Christian Wolf, obviously but also at an international level and as far as I'm concerned if you took Paul Wellens to one side and said privately is this the start of you wanting to take over the coaching job of England and why not? But why not indeed? Yeah, why not yeah. indeed? I mean, wasn't he involved in the England setup originally, um, prior to or during the World Cup? Something's niggling yeah, in the back of my mind that he was. Yeah, I understand that, but also he can understand that he's going to get a different uh, look at what internationals are all about from within in the past, but now from a different country. And Tonga's going to be a tough side. Oh, they are. They're not. They're not coming over here just to uh, just have a holiday. They they want to prove that they are, have the right uh, to be just as good as all the top sides, as Australia and uh, and England, etc. And that and that's how it should be. The more knowledge, the more that you ask, the better you will become. It's like training. The more you train, the better you become. The more you study, the more intelligent you become. That's why you and Eddie, we didn't study. <laughs> <laughs> You're right there, by the way. You're absolutely spot on. Uh, Sam Burgess, Steve-O, he keeps getting mentioned, of course, about coming over to Warrington next year. We all know, of course, now he's left the, the South Sydney rabbit holes. He's staying in Australia, though, for the birth of his child. But he's really busy recruiting for Warrington for next year, and he's landed his first signing, the Papua New Guinea international centre, Roderick Tai. He's going to join the club next year. Now, Tai played for PNG throughout the World Cup last year, and he actually got two tries at the Halliwell Jones Stadium in the win over the Cook Islands. He's from the Dolphins, which is the NRL's newest club, but he's featured in the main for the Queensland Cup team, the PNG Hunters. Eight tries in 19 games this year. Good signing for Warrington, do you think? Oh, without a doubt. You don't play at international level if you're no good. It's as simple as that. And you've also got to take into consideration um, that he knows about some of the best coaches in the world. He played under Bennett 
and Bennett made it quite clear when he went with the Dolphins that he wanted Burgess to come and help set all the new club up into the Australian uh, Super League and he'll do a good job there's no two ways about it but a lot of people perhaps don't realise that he was virtually pushed out at Souths because he came out with quite a few shall we say unusual remarks about some of their star players saying that the club itself, South Sydney, um, were being preferential treatment to certain players. And South didn't like it, and they had every right not to like it. So um, it was shown in the door. It wasn't a matter went. of it, it wasn't a matter of Burgess just saying, uh, "I want to get over to Warrington early." He came out with. Uh, a, pretty solid statements that, that upset the club, upset some of the players and they denied that anybody at South were being uh, given preferential treatment. Uh, I have no idea why, uh, why Sam would come out with this sort of thing and it was uh, goodbye Sam Burgess. And hello, Sam Burgess at Warrington. It sounds like it might be a lively place to be, the Halliwell Jones Stadium, in 2024. We'll wait and see. Well, it, it won't, I'll tell you one thing, Eddie. He won't mess around. He's been, he's been playing in the game. He knows the game long enough. He knows exactly what it's, what it's all about. And one telephone call to a man called Mr. Bennett, because they are very, very close friends. And who would you want to ask any sort of questions about rugby league coaching than Wayne Bennett there's nobody it's, better no nobody better and talking of Australia they've reached the final stages now of the NRL As you, you mentioned earlier Brisbane Broncos just clipped at the post for their first minor premiership uh, having been beaten by the Melbourne Storm at the weekend uh, Lee Briers the uh, Brisbane assistant he got them close but not close enough. Uh, the road ahead, though, in the bid for the grand final appearance uh, is uh, is coming. And reports here that the final series is heading for a complete sellout already in Australia. Correct. Oh, Correct. oh, oh, Steve-O, if only that were the case in yeah. the UK. Maybe the Challenge Cup final that has been pushed, pushed earlier in the season, that might help a lot of the families who want to go down to Wembley and see the Challenge Cup final uh, because sometimes it's so close to saving to go to the grand final I'm not so saying that, 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 that there's thousands that would be thinking that way but not everybody has got enough money in a period of say six or seven weeks where you've got Wembley overnight in London cost and also Old Trafford and I'm sure there are families out there that say, I'm sorry, kids, but um, we either go to Wembley or we go to Old Trafford. Earlier in the season, it, you know, mum and dad might say, well, we can go down in June and we can save again and then maybe we can do to the grand final. You've got to look at every aspect about what it is in this modern day. Everything is going up in price. It's not easy to console your children or no. yourself to, no, watch, to watch the game. That's right. The cost of living crisis is, is biting deep into everything over here, uh, I am sorry to say. The next few weeks, we have staff holidays. So you and I are going to take a breather. Um, Brian Carney will be talking to me next week in a special interview. And get, Steve, I know you're a, a big fan of the referees, but Phil Bentham, Phil Bentham has now taken over a leading role in VAR with the Premier League. And I'm going to be talking to Phil Bentham in the next week or two as well about his role in that and how it differs from the video referee in Rugby League and about his Rugby League refereeing career. So, so that's what's coming up in the next uh, few weeks. So we'll talk well, again as and when we can. You take care of yourself. And uh, I, don't know what, I don't know what the date is, but it's a few weeks. We'll have these two interviews and then we'll be chatting again. When I'll tell you something, the race to Old Trafford will well and truly 
be underway. So I look forward to talking to you then. Thank you.